everybody, and welcome back to my Zero Carb Life. I'm Kelly Hogan, and I have two of my dear friends with me today. I have Linda Salant and Amy Berger. Amy has been on the show before. She came on to talk about insulin resistance, and she really took a deep dive into that. And I have been dying to have Linda on the show. We interact a lot on Instagram. We DM. We mostly laugh at each other because she's funny. <laughs> Both of these ladies keep things very simple for the sake of just not muddying the waters for people, and I love that. I originally planned for this to be a Q&A, just question and answer. And when I got the questions from Instagram, people sent in a lot of questions. I was reading through and there were a lot of general themes. And just today, okay, like just 20 minutes ago, I thought a lot of these are sort of like lessons that I have had to just live through and learn. And I've, I've heard Amy and Linda talk about some of the things that they've just learned and changed or tweaked through the years. And a lot of it is the stuff that people are asking about. One of the main topics that people are asking about is how much fat and protein do you eat? How many grams of meat per day do you eat? How much do you eat? What do you eat? That's like the number one thing. What I would like for people to really, really come away from this hearing and learning is that aren't you done with that? Are, ha, have you not already tried enough diets where you had to track and weigh and measure and record every molecule of food you put in your mouth. But did you not come to these ways of eating to finally be free of that? Free of the neuroticism, free of, uh, are you ready to sit down to have a meal without pulling out your app and your spreadsheet and your food scale and your tablespoons? Like I'm begging you <laughs> to just step back and just, eat your food. I give you permission. Like if you have been waiting for someone to give you permission or give you their blessing to stop that, you have it right now. You take, consider this the blessing. Absolutely. I think people come to carnivore a lot of times for the simplicity of it. And then they're like, okay, well, the first thing they want to know is how do I complicate this? You know, yeah. like, how can I make this as difficult as possible? That's absolutely true. I mean, there are a lot of people that come to carnivore out of necessity that they need an elimination diet that they were not, you know, they were not trackers and stuff like that. So there is like that, uh, you know, a different population that comes, but if you're looking for a simple diet, that's going to get you healthy or keep you healthy. This is the one. And like to answer the question of like the macros and the grams and stuff like that. I, I don't like to, like Amy said, I don't like to live by the macro calculator. I eat as I am hungry. I eat when I'm hungry and I eat what I feel like eating. What I've done is I've changed cuts from fattier to leaner. That does not necessarily involve my pulling out a calculator to figure out how much I'm going to eat in that meal. What I what I have been doing because I want the data for the people is I put in the food that I eat afterwards. So I look at that package of meat and I say, well, I didn't eat the whole package. I ate three quarters of the package. I may weigh what's left and, I, and then say, here's what I ate. And then I put it in my calculator and then I've got my metrics for the end of the day. And so I can tell people where I fell, but I don't live to a strict macro. Like every day is not the same. I, yeah. I have a different, different grams every day, different grams of protein, different grams of meat, um, because some days I'm hungrier and some days I'm not. And when I look at all that data, it's very interesting, um, but it's just not necessary. You just don't need yeah. it. This is why like, I do not give people meal plans because I don't want to tell you what to have for lunch next Thursday. <laughs> if you're, is it even reasonable that your appetite and your hunger level should be exactly the same every day, all year long, no matter whether it's summer or winter or whether you ran 10 miles the day before or whether you sat on your butt the whole day, why should you eat the exact same amount of food, the exact same macros and proportions? It's natural that that should vary and you should honor that. Like if you're hungrier, why should you force yourself to not eat and if you're not as hungry, why should you force yourself to eat more? Okay, here's another lesson that I've learned through the years. And I don't know how you two feel about it, honestly. I I've heard you talk maybe a little bit. Um, but back in the fall, I had learned a lesson about organ meats. And some people were asking, do you have to eat organ meats? Is it really important? Will my health suffer? And for me, 
with organ meats. I didn't eat them for many years. And then I tried to really force the issue and ate them every single day. And I ended up feeling worse. So my lesson was not everybody thrives with lots of liver, but have y'all ever experimented or how do you feel about it? For me, I mean, I sort of grew up with liver a little bit, like, you know, chopped liver and uh, sauteed liver and stuff. So it was, uh, you know, it's a perfectly fine and good, delicious taste for me. So um, liver is not served very frequently in restaurants. So if I go out and there's liver on the menu, like liver and onions, I'll get the liver because I love it. Um, But liver is absolutely optional. I mean, to me, to eat liver every day with intention, I think is overdoing it. I think (laughs) that's sort of like, we don't need liver every day. You know, if you go back to like traditional great grandma liver Wednesdays, that's the way Uh it was like once a week you have the liver and everyone goes "Mm," and they eat the liver, but it's good for you. And so, you know, once a week you have some liver, maybe it's good for you. Maybe it's neutral, but um, I don't think it's harmful. And I do think it is completely optional. I'm not a big organ meat eater. Um, I, I do, I, I can do pate. I can do chicken liver. Um, I can do like a brown schweiger. I cannot eat a big slab of liver and onions. Like you get at a Jewish deli in New York city where I grew up. Like I, Oh, I can't do it. But I, I don't know that that's harming me in some way, not eating them. Um, it's, it's possible that those kinds of foods are more important when you're not already getting some of those nutrients from your normal diet. Like, like let's yeah. say you are someone who may, maybe you're not a vegan, but like you're not keto or close to carnivore. Uh-huh. So like you're not getting all that much vitamin A or whatever. I just, th- there's two, here's the bottom line. There's too many people thriving without it. Yeah, to be able to say that you have to get it, you have to get it like you know five times a week. There's too many people doing yeah. total time without it. Right. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I that's. I mean, fun look fact. at the Andersons, right? The Andersons do not incorporate liver, and how long have no. they been doing carnivore forever? Yeah. Charles Charles Washington, he will not touch it. <laughs> He's like, <laughs> no. Now, on the other hand, Amber, who was supposed Amber Horton was supposed to be with us tonight. Those of you don't know, but she had a last minute travel change. I know that she does sometimes eat them sort of like Linda, just because she likes them. She never forces it down, but she just sometimes enjoys it. Even brains. She says it's like a rare treat for her. I'm like, okay, you can have mine. (laughs) Again, would this guy pass up on a liver? Definitely not. He'd have it first from what I understand. And and he's also not going to go and kill 20 antelopes just to pile up all of their livers to eat those either. Yeah, that's part of the animal. All right. So let's talk about the scale. My own personal lesson learned is for me, I became obsessive. And that's part of the reason that for a long time, I did not eat fat. And I became just obsessive about counting calories is because every single day, First thing in the morning, okay, I would pee, step on the scale, and that determined whether or not the day before was a success. So I mm. I became just so hyper-focused on that. Nothing mattered to me about how I felt back in those days. It was like, who cares? It's about the scale. I do not weigh myself, but just a few times per year now. And even then, I sometimes get myself kind of hyped up in my head. I'm not totally cured from this. But staying off of it for me is very freeing. But Amy, I know you've given a lot of thought to this whole the, the scary scale thing. Please talk, tell us about this. You know, some people like to weigh themselves every day because they feel like it kind of keeps them from straying too far. And that's, that's fine. There's no right or wrong about how often you weigh. But if that number, a number on an inanimate object controls your self-esteem or your self-image or determines whether or not you're going to have a good day or a bad day or determines whether you're a good worthy person or a total failure garbage piece of crap human being again i'm going to use the b word begging i'm begging you not to weigh yourself Get rid of your scale, give it to a friend or a family member to hold on to for for six months or three months to say, listen, I can't weigh myself anymore for a while. Will you just hold on to this? Don't give it back to me for 30 days or 60 days. I, I might ask you, don't, do not give it back to me. This, it's extremely destructive mentally. And I, I, 
those of you that may be fans of me, I, I tend to talk in hyperbole. That's not an exaggeration to say that this yeah. is destructive. It's it's damaging behavior. And here, here's the thing to ask yourself, people. I want to say ladies, because it's mostly ladies, but there's some men that have scale yeah. issues. Does knowing that number ever help you? Ha have you ever benefited in any way from knowing that number? Does, does, would you die if you woke up one day and just went about your day and you didn't know what that number was? Would you have a problem picking your kids up from school or going to work and getting your job done? Or would it yeah. impair your life in any way if you simply didn't know what that number was? Because if, if you read the blog post we'll link to, yeah. There are so many reasons why your weight will fluctuate two to four pounds from day to day, totally naturally, doesn't mean you did anything wrong, doesn't mean you've lost fat or gained fat. That's just the fact that you have a human body and the human body is a little wacky sometimes with how it holds onto water and what it does. I will link to that. And you also have, it's a seminar coming up, correct? That'll talk about that as well. So I have, yeah, I have a course called The Stall Slayer, which is based on my book, The Stall Slayer. And it's about breaking fat loss stalls on keto. I think the same would apply to carnivore, but um, it's, I have a whole chapter in the book and there's a whole lesson in the course about not letting the scale play head games with you. Yeah. And Linda just recently learned her own lesson scale wise. Tell them about your experience, Linda. Well, so recently, like we were uh, discussing, I switched the way I was eating in terms of just eating some leaner meats and going higher protein and lowering my fat a little bit. And, and in 10 weeks, if you, you know, step on the scale every day, there was like no change in the end, there was a net three pound change. Some days I was up, some days I was down. But in the, at the end of 10 weeks, there was a three pound difference, which is like, if you tell somebody you made some kind of a major shift and you're sticking with this shift and it's going to be a great thing because you're going to improve your body composition, they'll say, well, how much did you lose? Three pounds. They'll be like, it didn't work. But let me yeah. tell you what, that three pounds was more than eight pounds of fat loss. And then I gained five pounds of lean muscle tissue. So it, the scale really is kind of like a liar because there were greater benefits to what I was doing than that could be shown on the scale. The scale just measures really like gravity's effect on you. It doesn't tell you what's going on inside your body. It doesn't tell you how healthy you are. Certainly we've seen very thin people just wasting away, um, very unhealthy. And so I think to use the scale as a measure of success for health generally is a pretty bad idea. And yeah, I have used your example so many times in talking to people since then because of that DEXA scan, because I asked them how would they feel if they had only lost three pounds in 10 weeks? And they were like, a terrible, terrible. Yeah. So what if you knew you'd lost eight pounds of fat and gained muscle? They're like, okay, awesome. The scale <laughs> yeah. won't show that at all. Like, right. that's yeah. Your size and shape can change dramatically with little to no change in your total weight. Just like Linda yes. had a drop of fat, but a gain of muscle. So your shape is changing. Your size is changing your physique, the way you look naked, like all this stuff is changing. Yeah. The, the scale just is not, it's simply not the best way to, to gauge what's happening. All right. Let's talk about what we have each learned about ourselves in regards to sweetness. <laughs> I, I know that Amy and I probably have a very different tolerance when it comes to sweetness, but the lesson I learned was my first long period of almost carnivore was meat and sugar-free stuff. So much meat and so much sugar-free. So it said zero <laughs> carbs. I was in great zero carb. I know how to do that. So it was a lot of uh, jello, sugar free jello, sugar free gum, sugar free mints, sugar free anything. And so I started to measure though and eventually realized, oh my gosh, no wonder I'm having cravings. My blood sugar is still going up and down with this stuff. And I couldn't ever really feel free from my sweet tooth that I'd had my whole life. I was skinny, I looked different, but in my head, I was still that same struggling person as before because I just wanted sweet. So that's the lesson that I learned from sweet things, but everybody is not quite as strict as I am. Can you tolerate some sweet taste? I have never been a sweets addict. That was okay. just never an issue for me. I'm, I was like a, a chips 
kind of a girl, always like savory stuff. So, you know, like Doritos was my thing. Uh, nachos were, was my jam. So for me, a little sweet taste here and there, it doesn't trigger me because sweet things are just not all that appealing to me. Um, like I can do, like I've been doing a protein powder yogurt breakfast and I'm absolutely fine. And there's some sweetener in that protein powder, but I'm not craving ice cream or donuts because of it. I think a lot of people though need to watch out. And so there is always that disclaimer there that if a little bit of sweetness is gonna take you completely off the rail, cut it. I'm not strict carnivore, so it's a little different for me, but I find that there are certain things I can have that don't trigger any cravings or any more desire for sweet, and, and like, I mean, my A1C is totally low, normal yeah. insulin, like metabolically and measurement wise, everything's fine. Like, for example, I'm never going to drink black coffee. Sorry, not going to yeah. happen. I'm going to have cream. I'm going to have sweetener, whatever my sweetener of choice, but I can have sweetener and coffee and I have zero desire for anything else sweet. Like okay. I don't then want a scone or a cookie. Yeah. Like I just have coffee and I move on. Um, same thing. I don't really drink diet soda anymore. Not, not cause I'm afraid of it. I just sort of lost the desire for it. I don't mm -hmm. want it anymore, but I used to drink like, and I could have a can and that was it. It didn't trigger more and more, but I will say kind of like Linda said, there were certain things like the key, you know, an almond flour cookie or a coconut flour brownie, forget that. Cause I'll eat the whole tray. So yeah. it's like, it, it seems to be, it depends on what it is. And I think that's, I think it's an individual thing. I think some people can have some of that and they're fine and some people can't, but I, I will also say, and I think probably all three of us would agree with this, but correct me if I'm wrong. If somebody's new to any of this, like if you're drinking a six pack of soda a day, please switch to a six pack of diet a day. Like yes. ideally, maybe, ideally, maybe sometime in the future, you just drink water or you don't drink the soda, but for your blood sugar and your insulin and whatever diet is going to be way better for you. And I know that there's going to be people out there that are horrified that somebody's saying that I will die no. on that hill. I do yes. not care make whatever transition step you need to make and don't let the fear mongers terrify you. If you're either going to have soda or you're never going to do a low carb diet or, yeah. or carnivore diet ever, then have the soda, but for God's sake, make it diet. Right? Yeah, I do for agree. Five, yes, for five years when I was getting boils everywhere and I was 260 pounds and I went to the doctor, he put me on this meat diet, but with zero carbs, you know, the diet stuff. I did not have one single boil in that five years. I mm. lost a ton of weight during that time. And I did, other than the fact I wasn't having enough fat, I had so many improvements. I still had cravings. So the cravings and the fact that I just was under eating on fat, those were the two main issues. But to have so many health improvements while I was drinking tons of diet soda, it was harder for me than what I do now. Any step people take in the in that direction of lowering sugar and grains and gluten and carbs, absolutely, that's a really valid point. And I don't think we say it enough. And I think it's yeah. because, because we do know now like that freedom. We always talk about this freedom, but a lot of us had to go through the diet soda stage to get here. Like I'm not saying, hey, everybody, it's the best idea in the world to drink. I know even from so many people who go from a keto diet to carnivore, there's something about taking out those little artificial sweeteners yeah. or the erythritol or the little whatever that makes a huge difference. Yes. So it can, but if somebody's not quite ready to go all the way, make the transition. That's fine. Yeah. Have, a, have a step in between. Yeah. Yeah. I think you have to sort of know yourself and you have to say, you know, what am I capable of if I am going to completely lose it and just go back to standard American diet, um, then it's worth it for you to have that like stepwise approach where you, you know, make a, take a baby step and change from Coke to Coke zero or something. Um, because you know yourself, you know, that you just are going to need it. I have had people so many times say to me, I just can't give up soda. They're, that's just not happening. And they're, they're pre-diabetic with autoimmune disease, but they're like, oh, I just can't give up my soda. And so for those people, you have to sort of give them a substitute because they're absolutely addicted, you know? So you have to give them a, 
practical substitute. So I will sometimes recommend if you really love the bubbles and that burn, maybe try a flavored but unsweetened seltzer water, which I love seltzers. And you know, there are even folks who are so like, oh, well, you know that seltzer water has the PFAs that are the forever kill. And you're like, okay, but seriously, they're having Mountain Dew. Like this would be a magical <laughs> step in the right direction. Let's don't talk about the PFAs yet. <laughs> I don't even want to hear about the PFAs in my seltzer. I love my seltzer and I'm still drinking them. It Bad. doesn't seem to be harming you. I, I think I'm okay. So far, so good, but it's only been 11 years. All right, <laughs> next. Let's talk about that dirty carnivore where you're doing lots of dairy and processed meats. And some folks say, you know, obviously it sort of goes with what we were saying. That's obviously better than if you were having, you know, a giant Subway sandwich or something. Um, then at least just have the processed meats that are on it and the cheese. I personally have found my lesson through the years, a little bit of cheese leads to a lot more cheese usually. And then I just don't feel quite my best. It does not kill me. I'm not like bedridden. It's more like, uh, another zit. I knew I shouldn't have had so much <laughs> cheese. And I get like a slightly drippy nose in the morning, you know, not the end of the world. But what are y'all's thoughts on this whole like, I don't know. Do people call is that dirty carnivore more? I guess so. I I don't know that I've heard dirty carnivore. I've heard dirty keto. <laughs> okay. But I think so. Yeah, dirty carnivore. It's like it's the things that are sort of like carnivore. They're carnivore. I mean, they sort of pass the test. They're carnivore. They've got some spices, so it falls into the zero carb carnivore uh, arena. And I yeah, you can totally overdo it on those. I have definitely overdone it on cheese and pepperoni in the past. And, you know, in my tests with continuous glucose monitors, I found the biggest spike I ever got was from a simple snack of pepperoni and cheese, uh, just like made myself out. little sandwiches. And I was shocked. I was like really surprised. And, um, and now I realize, well, that's not worth it. I mean, it was like out of range spike. It was so strange. And, you know, they say there's like, no carbohydrate or there was like, you know, two grams of carbohydrate yeah. per serving or something. Um, it's not optimal. And, you know, cheese for me is sort of like, I don't want to say it's a slippery slope because I can moderate the cheese, but there have been times where depending on the size of the ricotta cheese container that's in my refrigerator, I can totally throw down like one of those pint sized things of ricotta cheese, like no problem. Just eat that yeah. container till it's done. And that's just a lot of cheese. So I, I'm going to get to the processed meats in a sec, but you are not alone with the ricotta cheese. Like <laughs> I, and sour cream, sour cream is now a red light food for me because I could sit with a tub of sour cream, un, unflavored, just sour cream and a spoon and eat it like it's yogurt. Wow. Wow. Not such a great idea if you would like to, you know, slim down a little bit, like right. a little bit of sour cream is fine two cups of sour cream in a sitting, maybe not so much. But so I, my thought on the processed meat thing is, you know, I think most of everybody in the carnivore world is long past the red meat colon cancer thing. Yeah. Rah, like, yeah. But there's still a little bit of a lingering fear because even from carnivore diet proponents, you'll hear, well, no, I mean, grass-fed ribot, grass-fed steak, and yes. this is different from the, you know, from the regular, like, convent. No, that is not the, the issue because there's, there's also not really any link between the processed meat and colon cancer okay. because they still never separate out for the friggin' carbs. Right. If you're eating hot dogs and pepperoni and bacon and salami and prosciutto and bologna, what are you having it on? bread what are you having it with pancakes in the morning yeah. what are you having it on a hoagie roll a sub roll what are you having it with a soda orange juice in the morning like i there there is a a tiny there is a tiny increase in risk for health issues or whatever with the processed meats and the, the cured and preserved meats as opposed to not but we are talking a minuscule degree of difference and also yeah. it's all epidemiological studies anyway this is food frequency questionnaires yeah. you know how many cups of spare ribs did you eat last month like it's it's nonsense <laughs> do, do i think your entire diet should be salami no but should you be berating yourself and and 
feel, um, you know, negatively about yourself because you're eating bacon and salami. No, yeah. my God, like this, this again, like kind of what I said earlier, didn't we all come to keto, carnivore, low carb, whatever variation of this you're doing, didn't we all come into this to get away from the fear mongering and the sensationalism and the nuttiness? Like yeah. this is this is the safe place here. Stop everybody trying to make it unsafe. Like Linda mm -hmm. was saying, how can I take the simplest, least complicated thing and make it as complicated as possible? Stop doing that. Yeah. We are begging you. <laughs> Just eat your meat. <laughs> eat your meat when eat your meat when you're hungry. Get some movement in. Like move your body. That's one mistake I feel like I made. A lesson learned through the years is I had very little movement in my life. And I realized like, wow, I really could have been building more muscle, staying more fit. You do lose like some of your ability to move well and to be as flexible and strong if you don't use it. So I'm trying to add that back in, but move your body instead of staying inside in front of the screen. If you were to just switch some of that time out for time out in the sunshine, like there's so many tiny, simple, basic things that honestly, and as I'm saying these things, my little friend over here, he's looking like, duh, right? <laughs> eat your meat, lay in the sun, get good sleep, right? Get good sleep. So many things are just so basic. I love you both. Um, I'm going to post links oh, to, uh, to all of your things. So I'm going to make sure to get them from you to books and so that people can get in contact with you more. If you're not following Amy on Twitter and Linda on Instagram, they both do both, but that's where I would especially check for them is Linda Instagram Amy Twitter please do because it's a lot of great information I love you both and thank you thank you, thank you so much, so much.